you're going to find out. So in order for us to answer the question of why those big rocks are on our barrier islands, we first have to look at the forces that affect Georgia's barrier islands. So first, let's look at the constructive forces. So these forces are kind of exactly what they sound like. Construct means to build up or create. So the forces build up features on Earth's surface. So for example, um, crustal deformation helps shape the land. Um, so this can happen because of tectonic plates moving under Earth's surface. We also have volcanic eruptions. If a volcanic eruption were to occur, then that lava is going to cool off and change how an island looks. We also have deposition of sediment, and we see this a good bit on Georgia's barrier islands. So deposition of sediment means that that sediment has been carried by wind, water, or ice, and it's going to be laid down somewhere that it was not originally at. Georgia's barrier islands are also affected by destructive forces. So destructive forces mean to destroy. So first let's talk about erosion. So erosion is the geological process in which earth materials are worn away and transported by natural forces. So those natural forces that we're usually going to talk about are going to be wind and water. It's kind of a similar process to weathering. So weathering breaks down or dissolves rock, but doesn't necessarily involve that movement. Then we can also have some biological impact. And we'll talk about that biological impact just a little bit later. So one of the islands that we think a lot about when we're talking about constructive and destructive forces is Jekyll Island. It's a great example of how our destructive forces help shape our barrier islands. So waves, wind, and the ocean's current have slowly eroded away parts of the beaches on Jekyll Island. And this process has been amplified due to the shipping channels that are found close by. So let's take a little look at Jekyll Island and how their coast has been shaped. So both those constructive and destructive forces can actually be taking place on one island at the exact same time. So on Jekyll Island, the North Shore is slowly eroding and weathering away, but part of that sand is being deposited on other parts of the island. So if you take a look at these pictures, you can see how the north end of Jekyll Island is shrinking, but the south end of the island is actually expanding. However, erosion on each one of our barrier islands is going to look a little bit different. So remember, our definition of erosion is the action of water, wind, or ice that wears away soil, sand, or rock and transports that material several or hundreds of miles away. So for example, this house on Little Cumberland Island began to slide into the Atlantic Ocean after the beach started eroding away out from under it. The North Shore on Jekyll Island is commonly referred to Driftwood Beach, and that side of Jekyll shrinks a little bit every single year due to the erosion that's happening there. The Longshore Current is also an example of how erosion helps shape the beach. So take a look at these two pictures of Jekyll Island. You can see that they look vastly different. So the wind creates waves. And as those waves strike up against the beach at an angle, the sand actually moves down the beach. So during the spring, winter, and late fall, the winds tend to come from the northeast. And as those wind comes in, it helps carry the sand to the south. The summer winds may be from the south, but they're usually weaker and their duration is a good bit shorter so not as much of the sand is going to be carried. So if we look at these pictures closely, you can see where the beach has actually expanded um, out into the ocean a good bit in between 1960 and 1990. So by now you might be asking yourself, 
is this normal? Yes, the beach is dynamic, so it's always changing. And some of those changes come from our natural forces. So the wind blowing, those waves crashing and moving sediments around, and from the current shifting those sands from one place to another. But we also have our man-made forces. So development, we're people and we like to build things. So that's going to end up changing the lay of the land a little bit. Dredging also ends up changing our beaches a little bit. So dredging is where we come in with machinery and we make a canal deeper so that larger ships can get in to bring us goods from other countries and to also export um, goods that we create to other countries. Then we've also added Johnson Rocks to several of our beaches on Georgia's coast. So if you look at this picture down here at the bottom, that's an example of what those Johnson Rocks are going to look like. But if some of our beaches are eroding away, how do you think we can save them? Well, in order to do that, and in order to avoid our piers and other things looking like this picture on the top, we need to keep the stuff in the picture on the bottom. So let's talk about what those things are and how we can accomplish that. One of the ways that humans have started intervening in order to help save parts of our barrier islands is through beach renourishment. So this process is where sediment, so in this case, since we're on the beach, usually sand, um, where it's lost through that longshore drift and erosion, it needs to be replaced. So it's an important process because it helps protect both the island, but also remember we talked last week about how those islands protect our mainland from storms and those storm surges, hurricanes, and other things. So on Tybee Island, for example, sand is pumped from offshore um, and they add it onto the beach. So it's not the same grain size necessarily as the natural sand, and it's going to smother out some of the existing animals. So that's where we get into that biological impact that we mentioned earlier. So it's often a lot muddier, a little bit coarser, as you can kind of tell in this picture that we have up right now. But it's also going to change the slope of the beach. And over time, it can actually end up increasing some of that erosion. Another way that we can help save our beaches as by building groins or jetties. Those groins and jetties are actually going to catch some of the sand as it moves down with the longshore current. However, they don't permanently solve that erosion issue. So while erosion will slow down after the groin and jetty is put in place, it's really best if our beach is left naturally. So it's going to be able to um, do its natural thing over time. So let's look at some of the ways that our beaches help protect themselves naturally. So let's talk about our sand dunes and our marsh whack. So sand dunes help protect the island from wind and waves. They also provide natural beach stability and a supply of sand for the changing beaches. And it's also a habitat for a lot of our plants and our native marine life, which means they're very important. The sand dunes begin with the marsh whack. So if you look at the picture on the left-hand side of your screen, that marsh whack, a lot of times when we go to the beach, we might see it kind of as an annoyance, but, that marsh whack is actually super important because it helps create new sand dunes on our beaches. So the marsh whack is simply dead cord grass that has washed up um, with the waves. The marsh whack kind of becomes a mesh trap and it's going to trap the wind blown sand and any seeds that it's the wind has picked up. Because of this, the marsh whack plays a vital role in forming those new sand dunes. Plants help stabilize the sand as it continues to accumulate 
and support for the dunes comes from the root network that those plants are going to eventually create. We also talk a lot about sea oats. So those sea oats are a tall grass that grows on the coast of the southern United States. And it's also going to help hold those dunes together. So our sea oats are highly adapted to that dune environment. Their long curly leaves and tall oat heads trap windblown sand, which quickly causes them to become buried. By growing their vertical runners, like you can see in this picture, they're going to um, help produce new plants on the surface of the growing dune. The sea oats are going to stay ahead of that accumulating stand while a lot of other plants might become buried and eventually die. So our sea oats are kind of the master dune builders because those vertical runners are going to keep them up above the sand as it continues to build. But on many of our barrier islands, humans have chosen to intervene and behold sea walls or put in Johnson rocks. So here we see where some Johnson rocks were added to Jekyll Island. When the rocks were added in, it was hoped that over time the erosion would stop. However, seawalls deflected energy downward and actually increased the erosion over time. The rocks do slow down erosion, but they're not going to stop it. So in this picture, you can see that there's a boardwalk that leads over the Johnson rocks into the ocean. In the early 1960s, Jekyll sand dunes were destroyed in order to build bigger parking lots. But remember today, those sand dunes are protected by law and you can be um, charged with a stiff fine if you choose to destroy those sand dunes. So now we're a little bit smarter and we understand why those dunes are so important. But as a result of these Johnson rocks being added on Jekyll Island, the beach only really exists at low tide at many parts of the island. So next we're gonna do a little experiment so we can look at how erosion affects our beaches and how the water is going to affect things like those Johnson rocks. So remember, our beaches are dynamic and they're always changing. So if you look down at my sheet tray, we're gonna pretend like this is my beach and I'm gonna add a little bit of water in here so we can make some waves. So if my water that I'm adding into my sheet tray is the ocean. Remember, we've got waves, right? So that water is going to come in and out. And you can see if you look down here at my sheet tray as I come in and out, that sand is starting to move, right? So that's going to cause a little bit of beach erosion. So remember, we've talked about a few different ways that humans can intervene and stop some of that beach erosion from happening. So I'm gonna use blocks and my blocks are gonna be kind of like my jetty. So if humans come in and we build a jetty across the beach, or if we put our Johnson rocks in at the edge of the beach, when that water comes up, you can see that that erosion is only happening on this side of my rocks or if I were to turn my jetty or my rocks and that long shore current is coming down this way when the water carries the sand and other sediments down it's going to catch it right here at these rocks or at this jetty and that's going to cause the erosion to kind of stop or even almost um, slow down right there at that area. Thanks for joining us for episode two of Marine Monday. I hope you learned a little something about constructive and destructive forces on Georgia's coast. Join us next week as we learn about Georgia's sea turtles.